Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Connors, and I am one of the co-founders of the Notebooks Collective. We are a virtual literary arts space focused on community, connection, and continued learning. We have future events on our website for you to check out, including our next conversation, which will take place on April 5th with the poet M. Soledad Caballero. The Notebooks Collective believes Black Lives Matter and acknowledges that as a virtual organization, our offices are located on the unceded lands of the Kickapoo in Kansas and the Massachusetts and Pawtucket tribes in Massachusetts. With the events that bring people from all part of the US, we encourage you to check out this map, which I'll put in the chat in just a moment and share where you are. We also note that we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and against colonization and war in any form. We hope you enjoy tonight's event. We are super excited to have you here for the launch of Randall Horton's second memoir, Dead Weight, a memoir and essays, and to hear from Randall, his guests, Mark Johnson and Gary Lyles, and the host and moderator, Ashley Johnson. Now I would excited to turn it over to the other co-founder, Lisa Allen. Thanks, Becca. I will be introducing our guests, but before I do, I want to give you a little bit of an idea of how tonight is going to go. Uh, we'll have Randall read from his new book, and then Randall will be in conversation with Gary and Mark, and Ashley will be asking questions and moderating the panel. If there's time, Randall will read again before we open the floor to a brief Q&A. If you have questions to ask Randall or his guests, guests, please send a direct message in chat to me, Lisa Allen, and I will take questions to ask them after the discussion. Something that is really special about tonight is that Mark and Gary are not writers. Randall asked them to help him launch this book because he wanted a different kind of discussion at this particular book launch. And he asked them to be here because they knew him before he was the Dr. Randall Horton that we know today. They knew him when he was Hook, when he smuggled dope and when he was incarcerated. And he asked Ashley to moderate for two reasons. First, because she is a remarkably talented emerging writer. And second, because she is Mark's daughter. She has known Randall as a family friend and as an MFA mentor, and her insight is unparalleled. We thank her for being here. And we hope this is a way for all of you to hear not just Randall's work, but also about his life and the transformation he's been able to make. I will introduce our host, Ashley Johnson, and our poet and memoirist, Dr. Randall Horton. Randall will then introduce Mark and Gary before he begins to read from his new memoir, Deadweight. Ashley Johnson's essays have appeared in Sleet, Glassworks, and Iron City Magazine. Her essay, Sing, was nominated for a 2020 Pushcart Prize. She is currently working on a hybrid memoir that examines the residual effects of mass incarceration on the Black family structure. Ashley holds her MFA from the Solstice MFA Creative Writing Program of Pine Manor College, MA in Education from UMUC, and BS in Criminal Justice from Marymount University. Ashley currently resides in Silver Spring, Maryland with her husband and their two sons. We're really glad you're here, Ashley. In the opening essay of Dead Weight, Randall Horton writes, there is always a scene, a setting, a backstory. Today, my life is compounded by the effects of racism and incarceration, yet I manage not to be a statistic, not to be stuck in an ever-present stasis, unable to free myself from the invisible clutches of a system that would chew and spit me out raw. The reason I am here, cut out man, is that I need you to hear me. I mean, really listen and stand not in judgment, but as an ally, one who has endured the fire and can relate to the charred edges without uttering a word. You and I, dear attendees, are not cut out, man. If you haven't yet read Randall's book or the opening essay titled The Protagonist in Somebody Else's Melodrama, that reference is probably lost on you. Moreover, most of us haven't been through the same fire, fire that Randall has. Most of us haven't struggled with addiction, incarceration, or the daily injustices of racism. Our charred edges look different than Randall's. I know mine do. And yet, the reason we are here is to listen, really listen, 
And how can you do anything but listen when you hear Randall's voice? How can you do anything else when you open a book to encounter a memoirist so honest he takes you with him to the, to the drug houses, the alleys, the car he once lived in, and the train he rode between Harlem and DC when he first became a poet? How can you do anything but listen? I mean, really, really listen when Randall takes the mic and reads poems that in part sound like this. If only I could pastel language onto a canvas of thistledown. Yes, deceit comes to mind. A lie, traitor, turncoat, recreant, backstabber to truth, I would be gut shanked a thousand times. This is not that poem, nor am I that poet to hold your hand. I'm not going to list Randall's creds here because if you're here, you know them. And if you don't, you should learn them. Instead, I'm going to say, if you were to meet Randall, say at a workshop, like I did, he'd never tell you how much cred he's earned. Instead, he'd read your essay and say something like, my dad loved John Wayne too, or your aunt's name is Rosalie, I've got a Rosie Lee. What I'm saying is that he'd listen, really listen, so he could find a common thread, a connection, no matter how different our chart edges looked at first glance. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Randall Horton and Ashley Johnson, Mark Johnson, and Gary Lyles, and in celebrating the launch of Randall's second memoir, Dead Weight, a memoir in essays. Mike is all yours, Randall. Wow, I'm kind of blown away by that uh, introduction, Lisa. Um, thank you so much. I'm very humble uh, and you know, I know you left out that you are definitely uh, a, a writer as well um, and talented writer too and uh, an amazing writer. And so I just want people to know that. Uh, I don't want that to get lost in this translation uh, as we start, you know. And so um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming. I uh, see a lot of um, friend, friendly faces, uh, people I've known uh, or know. And some I don't, um, but you know, thank you all for, for coming um, to this virtual book launch. Um, and I've invited a, a couple of um, friends uh, along. Um, first we have, um, and Gary's gonna kill me because I don't have his bio, but I know him. And so we're gonna, t I got it. <laughs> but Mark <laughs> sent me a bio last night. And so if Mark Johnson holds his BS in communications from Bowie State University and his AA in addictions counseling from Anne Arundel Community College. He is a master's of science candidate in the mental health and rehabilitation counseling graduate program at the University of District of Columbia. Mark is an Oxford House Inc. is an Oxford House Inc. resource coordinator for the District of Columbia and outreach coordinator for Prince George's County. Mark is a certified peer recovery specialist, peer supervisor, support supervisor, recovery coach, and a master Reiki teacher. Um, and so, um, you know, Mark and I went to Howard together, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that um, a little bit later on, but we went through some of the same things around the same times. Our timeline spanned together uh, over almost 20 years are intersecting some kind of way uh, in and out. Um, as with um, Gary, uh, Gary Lyles, uh, my good friend, Gary Lyles uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, Gary currently has a CDL and he's driving um, right now. And um, Gary's getting ready to make some life changes. I'm not going to tell them all right now. Um, but I'm very proud of the things that he's done, um, you know, since coming out of incarceration. Um, I know he did 17 and a half years. Um, and, you know, we share uh, a, a, a very tight bond because um, we've been through so much together. Um, and to see, you know, not only Gary, but Mark too, to see him, to see these guys um, in amazing situations right now. Uh, I'm just proud of both of them. And, and it's a blessing that we can have them here today um, to sort of talk about something that we lived through, the fire that we went through. Because as you find, you'll come to find out, um, it wasn't an easy thing, right? Um, and so with that said, I'm gonna um, 
maybe read a little bit from the book. How about that? That's what y'all came to hear. And so, um, uh, I, I won't read from the, the opening section. Um, I don't think I will. Um, Lisa was reading from that the protagonist and somebody else's melodrama. Um, but that that piece is kind of special for, uh, to me. Um, that piece, um, the piece, um, and I see Zanis here. Um, I was invited um, to do the Ralph Ellison lecture uh, at Tuskegee University a few years ago. Um, and they asked me to, you know, to deliver this lecture, and I did. And and I and I just decided, you know, I, I know at the time I was staying in Harlem, um, not too far from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man statue, um, the Invisible Man statue, which I call Cutout Man in this book. Um, and you know, some kind of way, I just figured a way that you know that I start talking to. I mean, not talking, but just sort of going up there writing and sort of like wondering what it would be like to sort of talk to this person, this protagonist, um, as our lives kind of mirrored each other in some kind of way. So um, that's what that's all about. But even throughout the thread of the book, I think you still hear, you know, you get those um, themes of invisibility, right? Um, and um, and understanding that, you know, as with Ellison's um, uh, Invisible Man, you, you sometimes you, you're you operating uh, under other people's con constructions, right? Um, and strings that are pulled by other people. But anyway, um, let's, let's, let's just hop right into it. Um, this one is called um, Perception Versus Reality. And, um, yeah, I think it'd be pretty effing. I'm talking, you know, I, you know, and I'm trying, I'm going through a few things in terms of language and um, criminal justice system and, you know, things I, I kind of went through a little bit. It is 1992. Full-blown gentrification is at least 10 years away and will erase all evidence that we occupied this space. But for now, my friends and business partner, Dirty Red, Bigfoot's D and I huddle in the crevice between storefronts on Park Road selling dimes and twins of cocaine. Like-minded entrep uh, like entrepreneurs operate nearby along with the addicted and the homeless giving license to the term open air market, meaning cash and carry and smoke all you can as long as you can. Sharing this subjugated space is a car hanging a right onto Park Road in what looks like slow motion. My eyes register the turning car at barely two miles per hour before it becomes before it comes to a complete stop in the middle of the street. A man hops out of the passenger side at a rate of speed that would feel much faster when I rewind the scenario years later. But for an instant, the man could be treading through five feet of liquid tar. There is a Glock at his side as he maneuvers between two parked cars steps into our personal space, then places the tip of the barrel on the scalp of the person who's bending down alongside D and trying to decide which dime he would choose from those in the bag. At the moment of the gun's contact with the scalp, the customer who is stooped with D realizes that a bullet is milliseconds away from tunneling into his brain and ducks causing the, knife, the now fired bullet to slightly graze his skull. This minor gesture alters the bullet's trajectory enough that it tears through blue jeans and cotton underwear and explodes D's left testicle. D is now lying in a pool of blood on the pavement minus a left testicle while the gunman retraces his steps back to the waiting car. The intended target meanwhile flees east on Park Road Realizing that D could die from the gunshot wound, Big Fooks, all six foot seven of them, scooted D up from the pavement, carrying him like a rag doll to my samurai park down the street. We drive down Irving Street, cross over to Park Place, and merge onto Michigan Avenue all the way to Washington Hospital. We carry D through the emergency entrance doors, looking like we had come from a military combat zone with blood on our clothes, and we're entering the triage unit. Past events, scenes with rising and falling action that refuse erasure by the passage of time, often resurface when I'm addressing a classroom full of undergraduate students who trust me 
as a symbol of authority and an expertise. How ironic the situation, especially in an institution that specializes in keeping the prison industrial complex supplied with young people who are fascinated by the forensics and crime scene investigation portrayed in TV crime shows. The programming they watch builds a brand of criminality and incarceration, reinforcing a criminal justice system that criminalizes the perceived criminal long before contact. Until my class, these, these students have never been taught by a professor with seven felony convictions. So when I appear in flesh and blown as a palpable human being with stories to recapitulate what they thought they knew and to what they should be known, the students are indeed curious about their perception versus my reality. Their knowledge of incarceration um, the criminal justice system and what occurs while one is detained is riddled with stereotypes, misbeliefs, misbelie misconception, generalities, or plain na naivety. In most of my introductory classes, I have my students read the award-winning play Short Eyes by the New York poet and former sing sing resident Miguel Pinheiro, whose characters often offer the reader an unflinching narrative of what really occurs on the inside. The prison in the play based on Rikers Island is em emblematic of an inverted society where the Black and Latino population dominates the narrative, setting dis settling disputes and keeping social order. Whiteness is at their mercy, there being no privilege enjoyed by white detainees. One Latino inmate named Cupcakes realizes quite quickly he is not as street tough as he imagined and becomes sexual um, prey to predators much more callous and desensitized to humanity. He is constantly subjected to unwanted sexual advances by Blacks and Latinos and realize that there is no refuge for the weak and feeble. Race alone cannot save cupcakes from potentially being deflowered. This is the point in the play where my students I, and I usually need to talk or have a conversation about prison rape. Many of them think that Pinheiro's play exaggerates the prevalence of sexual assaults, believing the narrative they've been taught over the years that downplays the existence of prison rape. One student who later, who later follows in his father's footsteps to become a correctional officer remains adamant that rape does not happen in prison anymore. This is what I tell him. In housing unit 3C tier, Roxbury Correctional Institution, when someone is escorted out of the cell with all of his belongings, it is often the cause of some form of sexual assault has happened, has been happening in the cell. Debo, my first cellie, was in for murder, walking down a 60-year stretch. Across the hall, Tony, who was serving three years for distribution of jurors, came and asked whether I would switch cells with him if the correctional officer approved. approved. His celly was Big Pun, who was now closer to my own, who was closer to my own age. So I figured that youngins wanted to be with youngins and went along with the request, no harm, no foul. Debo and Tony, who were both from Southeast DC, were, as, were inseparable after that day. Sold commissary together, hung out in the yard, acted tough, and some guys were afraid of them. One day, about six months after the cell move, the extended time for evening lock-in signaled that something was wrong. A cell door rolled back and Tony was escorted out by correctional officers. His possessions in a cardboard box and his head covered with a wool blanket. As each of us, our faces pressed against the rectangular glass windows of our cell doors, watched Tony walk down the hall, we knew that he had he had checked into protective custody. Debo was raping Tony in the cell where Debo and I once set up late night talking about what we used to do on the streets. After the other cell doors opened back up, news circulated quickly. I have given each student something to ponder. Nobody looks me directly in the eye. The truth can be uncomfortable, so I ease up a bit. The correctional officer's son believed that his father was a good guy, and perhaps he was. 
The student confided to me that he admired my resiliency, how I escaped my environment to teach at the university. Over time, our relationship morphed into a mentor and mentee, and I decided to tell him about a correctional officer I knew named Big Grip. Before serving my sentence at Roxbury, I was housed in seven locks in a unit dedicated to rehabilitation and alternative to incarceration. Big Griff ship usually lasted until evening lock-in. Over the course of a, over eight months in the block, I was allowed to leave my cell during lock-in to clean the unit and prepare meal trays for the other inmates. Standing six foot nine and weighing close to 300 pounds, Big Grip was the antithesis of most correctional officers I came in contact with during my time on the inside. I started talking with Big Grip about growing up in the South and about the racism we both endured as children of the 60s. He played basketball at a small division two school, school in the Midwest. So we talked a lot about sports too. What's more important about the conversation is that we talk human to human. Big Grip didn't talk down to me or treat me like a plea. I came to understand that as a correctional officer, he was not the norm that he was as different from normal as they come. The first time I endured, the first time I returned to the inside without guilty and sentenced to attach to my name was at Seven Locks, where I was asked to come and talk about my journey from prison to PhD. Upon entering, I wondered whether I had gone insane or somehow developed an amnesia. Here were the same halls I once walked, hands cuffed behind my back, the blue trumpet and melody still hidden but screaming within the walls, where my one and only visitor was my mother, who traveled all the way from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, wanting to see her only son, where I learned that girlfriends leave the bad guys once they are locked up, that friends disappear and that the family you thought you had on the street it's not your family. On my first night inside, a fist fight occurred, and I discovered the importance of keeping shoes on at all times to avoid slipping and falling on the concrete floor when engaged in a physical altercation. I learned this valuable lesson by observing my cellmate throw hands with a dude over a word exchange, and because the other dude did not have sneakers on, and my cellie did, victory was determined by shoe traction. Blood splattered on the concrete floor all the way to my cell door. And ain't nobody see nothing is what we told the guards to protect my cell mate from solitary confinement and the dreaded hole. When I left to go upstate, Big Grip said he didn't want to see me again. But when he did see me again and I wasn't wearing a jumpsuit with an inmate number, Big Grip gave me a tight hug like he was proud of what I had become as if he always knew. That day I sat in the same circle I once sat in and shared my essays and poems on my changing self. Except that this time I led the discussions. We talked about what it was like to re-enter society with the mark of ex-convict and the role that would have to be traveled to participate in the great American experiment. I gave the guys what I could, what worked for me, yet I know it wasn't enough because I left and they stayed behind. I tell my student that guys on the inside often have nicknames like Woke, Baby Side Frog, Blue Meat, Graveyard Pimp, Chicken Head, Nut, Hell No, Fat Man, Lil Nine, Bigfoots, White Boy, Cuban, and Disco. Names that give them an identity in a society that fails to fully recognize their presence. Many of these men use deviancy as a form of rebellion against a system that has not pledged allegiance to them a system that perpetuates racism and other forms of oppression. The men also carry names like felon, convict, inmate, and prisoner. Names that will never leave them once they are released, if they're lucky, into the world. These guys will always be an ex-something, fighting a stereotype that hovers like an albatross over anyone connected to the criminal justice system. Whether past, present, even me. I tell my students that not one single person will go to jail for not being a nice person. 
it isn't illegal to be rotten, to be an adulterer, to keep cultures in poverty through legal practices, or to harbor hatred for people. My students know this yet fail to make the correlations. A funeral or home going for my identity as X has been in the making for quite some time. I can honestly say this now without regret, without worrying that someone might not understand its necessity. The death of nomenclature such as felon, convict, inmate, prisoner, and X within the language of reform must occur if criminal justice is to evolve. For a society to advance and rethink how it addresses those entangled within the criminal justice system, the language it uses must be reevaluated. I've been calling myself ex-felon, ex-convict, and ex-inmate, and ex-prisoner because as an advocate, a real life example works better than a hypothesis. Those skeptical of radical reform want me to retell my transgressions in great detail using a restrictive language I neither wish to use nor believe in. Above, above all else, they want me to be convinced that I am morally good now that I am full of redeemable qualities. I need to share stories like the one on Park Road, that Park Road incident with its violence and guns because they reinforce the tropes and the skeptics expect to hear in process. I need to reassure them that I am not that person anymore. Right? The person of myself as the, the, the performance of myself as ex-convict Someone with seven felony conviction who manages to overcome these hurdles seems great and awe-inspiring on the surface. I say performance because I know I am not an ex anything. It took time, but I eventually learned, I eventually realized that my thinking was a setup, the way the narrative was supposed to be, that even in my greatest achievement, that even my greatest achievements would echo and reaffirm the system. The con is actually the system itself manipulating language to denote deviant behavior. X as a labor place tricks on people returning to society by making them unsure of their self-worth. They are duped into believing that to achieve social normalcy, their repentance must always be juxtaposed against the mark, the stain, or the felony, or the felony that is more of a cattle brand, a signature, signature of identification and ownership. Thus, any advancement comes at the expense of the self and celebrates the system that contained that self. Ultimately, the question becomes, how can one ever be unblemished with such a stain? For example, after serving a prison bid and rehabilitation program, I found it terrifying to sit with a room full of strangers at the University of the District of Columbia though one could say I should have felt lucky to be in a college classroom. Early on, I constantly felt judged as I took notes and as though no matter how hard I tried to mark, how, how hard I tried to hide the mark of the X, people knew and were criticizing me behind my back, labeling me as something bad, even if I tried to represent good. I wasn't that dude on Park Road anymore, but they didn't care. I can sense the interior dialogue. Did you hear about the dude in your class who's been locked up? Keep an eye on him. He might steal something. The obligation to explain those felony convictions became dehumanizing to the point that I would get angry at people who inquired about my past as if their house stood spotless, as if something from their childhood or college days or some other dastardly moment in time that had been suppressed was not real. And yet it was I who was regularly put on the witness stand to explain myself. I needed to be humble to a fault, careful to straddle the line between confident and arrogant. I struggled to find value in this new self, independent of the ex that I was trying to create. Then there were the dinner parties and get togethers with upwardly mobile people who presented the illusion that their lives were perfect that they were morally good and had never done the wrong thing, that it was I, the ex, who didn't quite fit the mold. Questions like, what do you do? Where did you go to school? What are you working on now? What, what career path did you take? 
often created a deer in the headlight moment for me. They all ultimately led back to the inside. The best piece of advice I received after my release came from Big Fred, an old hustling buddy who was familiar with the sale. Big Fred had completed a two-year federal bid and was working as a real estate and mortgage lender in Washington, D.C. One night after the cookout at his house, we talked about the weight one carries after prison. Big Fred told me that everybody has a little clutter in the closet, that the people you think are doing okay are at times living in their own form of hell. We went through a list of men and women we knew who lacked felony convictions, but were known to be evil, rotten, nasty, and malicious. Yet society treated them as if they were angels, incapable of doing the wrong thing ever. This imbalance of moral judgment is why the ex must die. I'm not going to chase my own tail, nor will I continue to use language from the handless toolbox to get to deconstruct and, de and define my own existence. Why strengthen criminology's image as guardian through my personal narrative? I prefer to create my own toolbox of language. So to the person who carried that old toolbox, the death of X will not be caused by the blade, a slash across the wrist or throat bleeding out in night silence. It will not be caused by an entry and exit wound, torn flesh, or bullet to the temple that splatters bone and brain matter. This death will be effected by a brushstroke across the canvas of life, blotting out the current image to get to a more viable image in the eye of the beholder. My goal is to erase a stereotypical life drawn without permission, correcting a wrong for the sake of a right, a righteousness. This death I seek will be done by erasure. <laughs> All right. I know y'all with me. So, yeah, man. Um, let's move right along. Um, I'll read from And So It's Complicated. Um, like I said, I'm going to read three pieces, um, and then we'll get into a few things. Um, <clears throat> and so it's complicated. Question. Is there clemency for the mute body screaming guilt? I only ask because the first slap recoiled like a back, like a car backfiring. The second became a Sunday morning center wheel after a long night of vermin, bourbon, followed by another backfiring slap echoing against the alley and gutted brownstones. Then please don't. Why? It's not the question, I shouted. But the woman being hit three stories below did. Hit or a slap might resonate too delicate with the ear, more like beat. Yep, he was beating the living fuck out of her. But I didn't do nothing. She stuttered between slobs and I would go get it. And I heard it all. To peer three stories down from the apartment and the abandoned building meant being witness to a man beating a woman to confront the infinite curse of addiction, homelessness, and mid life has spiraled out of control. The above post on Facebook describes a troubling memory of a fight I witnessed in the mid 90s while smoking cocaine in an abandoned building on 14th and P Street in Northwest section of Washington, D.C. Without a doubt, the experience is difficult to revisit, let alone write about, and in the post I leave it unclear as to what I did, if anything, to prevent the assault from occurring. A poet and friend from Montgomery, Alabama, came across the post and emails me that same day, finding the passage quite disturbing. She simply asks, what did you do? To be honest, when I emailed her back, I don't I don't completely answer the question because to do so would require a lengthy explanation more than I wanted to provide in the email that day. To start, she would need to know about Debbie and the rocky relationship between the two of us, how we got sucked into the metaphorical blizzard of cocaine. Debbie and I tried to save each other from the streets, but as I said many times before, two addicts don't make a right. 
One night at the room we rented on Florida and North Capitol Street, Debbie became enraged during an argument and accused me of cheating on her with another woman. When I reminded Debbie that she sold her body to eat, get high, and pay rent, she replied that that was beside the point. We argued a bit more before I left for a few hours to avoid a physical altercation, only to return to hell half no fury like a woman scorn, scrawled in red lipstick on the mirror above the sink, and all my clothes shredded with a knife and dials in human urine. This was my introduction to that saying, and I wonder what it meant in relationship to her and me. A year later, I ran into her on 14th and V Street in an area that always throws me for a loop when I visit busboys and poets today, a restaurant, bookstore, and lounge popular in the Washington, D.C. literary scene. I cannot look at busboys and poets for what it is. Instead, I see what that strip of land once represented. B Street between 13th and 14th was at various times an open air market filled with women and men who sold their bodies along with those who sold what was then called crack. To understand how far Debbie and I had ventured down the rabbit hole to give my poet from Alabama, my poet friend from Alabama contacts about my post. And to answer her question, I would need to provide some historical perspective. Freebase, Ready Rock, Crack. I would explain to my poet Freebase, my, my poet friend that Freebase is a derivative of powder cocaine, a paste that forms when the powder is cooked. During the early 80s, young hustler chemists learned or were taught that this form of cocaine, once converted to Freebase rock, produced quick profits. These hustler chemists then began to sell what would be called ready rock on the streets used to on the, called ready rock on the streets to users. This type of cocaine sold well and quickly. So the hustler chemists devised a way to increase profits by producing more rock from the free base using a substance called comeback. The chemical ratio required a delicate balance of trial and error, greed versus good product. Because my poor friend never knew me as hook, I would need to reveal how most of the kilos I smuggled into the United States originated from South America, wrapped in fiberglass. The cocaine so potent it created a medicinal odor that could saturate an entire room. If the product registered more than 0.9 grams on the cookup of a, of a gram, it could be stretched for comeback to 1.25 for wholesale or 1.5 for street soldiers. I would tell my poor friend that the day cocaine transitioned into red rock isn't known, but the day crack became king in my personal realm is quite as crystal clear. I would tell my poor friend that customers came out of the woodwork, their frames frail, faces gaunt, pupils twinkling as if the secret to everlasting life were being sold on the low low, an amulet of eternal possibility wads of cash procured from liquor store robberies, neighborhood check fraud, three-card money games played on the bus, family theft, food stamp resale, breaking and entering, abuse of the body, and many unthinkable acts. The proceeds needed for the purchase of the beige rock that has suddenly appeared on the streets. My poor friend would need to know that in 1989, once the first stem was lit in the back stairwell of the apartment complex of Southeast DC on Chesapeake Avenue. Customers would come running back to the source of this euphoria, not one by one as they had done in earlier times, but two by two and three by three until the 14 gram beige rock disappeared from my hands. It could have been a magic trick minus the abracadabra, but it wasn't. It could have been in a Donna Gorn's novel, but it wasn't. The poet would need to know, to be educated on how a comeback created a subculture of demos known as the fake out. Looks like crack, burns like crack, but smells and tastes like plastic. The most desperate of fiends would crush a peppermint until it was all white, lace it with baking soda, place it in a plastic bag or a vial, and attempt to pass the demo as if authentic to someone more desperate. But the comeback, vitamin B12 yeast or mixing whatever other mixing agent that added weight and yielded decent quality was a game changer. 
the cutting agent mixed maximize profits per the cutting agent maximized profit perfect in an economy where capitalism was encouraged as an American way of life. It made life easier for the addict, for the rock was pre-cooked and offered easy access. Just take it out of the plastic bag, vial or aluminum foil and put it right into a straight shooter. So in the mind of the young street hustler, this was an opportunity, the right environment and a captive audience. Along with combat came the working 50 in the, and later the working 30 in DC. The names are apropos for the amount of money they referred to were designed to fulfill two things, an addict's dream and a hustler's hope. An investment of the $50 could be double or quadruple or the, at the very least provide the opportunity to break even, smoke some, sell some, get another one and repeat, continuing the marathon as long as you could. But the double meaning of combat, the flip side of this fool's goal where the fiend keeps coming back for more is what's more important. There is a direct correlation between combat and the white bloom of the 80s from the perspective of levels of chemical dependency as if the addict were a lab rat being exper experimented upon. Debbie and I represented both ends of that spectrum, but we were caught in a battle we could never win. Because my poet friend from Alabama has been to bus boards and pools, I would ask her to imagine herself in that area in the early 80s. Driving north on 13th Street and taking a left on V, she would have approached a spot where the establishment would appear within 10 years. V was a dimly lit street right with illicit activities, hustlers, sex workers, stick up men, a pimp named D'Angelo ran a brothel behind an elementary school that is now Meridian Public Charter School. And in the nearby alley, a chop shop operated around the clock, taking in stolen vehicles and making them disappear more quickly than a hand clap. D'Angelo left the house and in about the time I reemerged from a homeless stint, I became a player on V Street and set up shop in the house through Pepper, a woman who had helped me survive when I became homeless on T Street years before. Pepper stayed in the back room facing the chop shop, and I fronted and her boy I, and I fronted her and her boyfriend short man packages of powder cocaine to sell. They cooked the powder with come back to stretch the profit. When I ran into Debbie on the side of the V Street, the now lines a renovated park with a full length basketball court and bat and baseball diamond. She was trying to turn a trick to buy a working fifty from Pepper to sell to women chasing that five minute high all night across town in Northeast DC. Because there was history between Debbie and me and perhaps because she was jealous that Pepper was somehow someone I trusted, Debbie asked me to watch her back before I went into the house by the alley. It was taking Debbie a long time to find a date so she ventured closer to where Bus Boys and Poets is now, trying to catch a John. And we ended up one block north on 14th and W. There had been love between Debbie and me and in many days I am at loss to understand what that love was. I would tell my poor friend about the two young men, barely 20 years old, who were hanging out by the fire hydrant in the middle of the block, drinking a 40 ounce bottle of beer and counting money from drug sales. Suddenly and without provocation, one of the men began to chastised Debbie for walking the streets, accusing her of selling demos to this clientele. Maybe his mother and sisters were in the same predicament, walking the streets trying to feed their physical and mental hunger. But clearly, there was disdain for what Debbie represented. Debbie, not wanting to back down, began a verbal exchange with the guy not selling demos. Things escalated quickly and the dude slapped her in the face while his partner remained silent in the background. In retrospect, maybe Debbie wanted this altercation to escalate to see if I still cared in some way, to see if I would protect her. When he proceeded to slap her again and uttered bitch and fuck you, I felt I had to intervene. And I began to exchange knuckles with the man on W Street 
And right when I appeared to be getting the better of him, his partner walked up and shattered the 40 ounce bottle against my skull, sending me to the ground in the daze. Blood trickled down my face and then it was two on one with body blows and foot stomps until they got tired. We were not alone on the block, but unlike T and V streets, I was an outlier on W Street, so no one dared help. Nobody fought fair or, or, or with honor anymore, and so for the people standing around watching me getting stomped, the sight was nothing unusual. As I would tell my poor friend, however, the story on W Street does not end with body blows and foot stomps. I would tell her that pride is a dangerous thing on the street. Pride will cause one to make rash decisions that may affect the future in ways unimaginable. Pepper's boyfriend, short man, owned a 45. When I returned to B Street and went to their rented room, blood trickling down my face and smeared on my shirt, the 45 was the only thing on my mind. That and putting bullet holes into the two men on W. I wanted to hunt them down and feel the revenge while squeezing the trigger. The streets create the animal, the rage, the cold hardness toward another human being. It turns one into jagged piece, jagged edges, broken shards of glass. Perhaps thinking it through in ways that I could not, Pepper and Short Man blocked the exit of the door, preventing me from leaving after they gave me the gun. Pepper looked me in the eye as if to ask, is it worth it? Wisdom sometimes comes in unexpected ways. Both Short Man and Pepper had the counter street credibility I wanted, but perhaps it came with ghosts that would never stop haunting them. On more than one occasion, I've been told I didn't belong. And at this moment, I heard it again. Not in words spoken, but by, by the blocking of the door. In the distant future, I would know what it meant to try to take a person's life, to think someone died and rejoice in that death, only to want to take everything back the next morning like it never happened. Pepper and Short Man were trying to tell me what I would come to know later. Hell have no fury like a woman scorned. The fact that a woman was getting beat Beaten by a man did bother me, but the memory of body blows and foot stumps and the 40 ounce bottle cracked against my head with subsequent stitches and a scar, the price for trying to defend the woman still remained. Hope is an optical illusion, more often times than not, but I hope that the woman getting beat in the alley would somehow survive. Oftentimes, memories are manipulated to present the picture we want to believe is truth. When in actuality, we lie through memory, recreating a series of events in our head to make a tragic event seem more palpable. I realized that my scorn for Debbie came from the fact that I, re I, re I realized that my scorn for Debbie came from the fact that I refused to see her as a complete human being, that I placed too much value on perception. In her eyes, she made the ultimate sacrifice by selling her body, and she manned the count of loyalty in return that I could not give. Two years after that altercation, I ended up homeless once again, smoking cocaine in that abandoned row house and listening to a woman get physically assaulted in the alley. I would tell my poor friend that memory would eat your ass alive. When I heard the lady being assaulted, I remember the beating I had taken, the fact that no one had come to help. I knew that I would not, I could not intervene now because these streets can turn violent in a heartbeat. No amount of rehabilitation can block that memory. Ah, oh, man. Okay. Um, yeah, man, where were we at? Hey, Randall. Yeah. Time is going so fast because I think we could all listen to you read forever. <laughs> uh, do you mind if we pull? No, we can go right to it. Actually, we are we're cool. We, we, I'm, okay. we, I'm good. Actually, I need to stop here and get some. I'm good. Okay. So, gonna, yeah. Um, gonna, bring Ashley in. Um, and we can uh, begin to talk a little bit. You want to do that? 
first of all, like, yeah, like Lisa was saying, I was like, just kind of laying back and like, listen to, to you read the book. I wish it was like an audio book because that's how I would have, you know, would have had the ear pods in while I was following along. No, but it's really beautiful writing. Um, very musical. Okay, so I, I got some questions. I got some questions. Um, so the first one is just for you and nobody okay. but you. Okay. Okay. So what were you after in this book? Like, can you share like a question or an idea that you were like probing through the essays? Like what was something that kept coming back? I was, you know what? I think I was after um, the things that I had, that I, I was after all the things, all of the things that I feel to see throughout my life and different markers that made a difference in, um, you know, where I, you know, that, that made a difference in my life or in either one, one way or the other, either, you know, uh, good or bad or sort of with pivotal moments. Let me put it like that. Pivotal moments that sort of like, you know, were instrumental in me, you know, getting to where I am today and whether that's good or bad, um, they occurred um, going all the way back from, from when I was a child. Um, and I think um, I was looking for answers uh, along the way too, um, different things. Um, I don't think I write that book if I don't write um, the first part um, with the protagonist. Somebody I can't. I don't think I write the book um, because it gave me a way to sort of get free and look at some things. But then to springboard off into these other essays that are just sort of you know that, you know wide and varied. Um, but all of it, all of them have to come back to that, you know, that 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 longer essay that it just really proves, you know, my coming of age in Birmingham and um, all the things that that sort of like um, I, I, I kind of went through. Not saying that other people don't go through them because um, I know they do. Uh, but uh, for me, being able to highlight those and bring them to life in some kind of way. Uh, as a writer, you know, was important, right? Yeah, I thought that the like that intro essay, the protagonist and somebody else's melodrama, I told you, I thought it was brilliant. Cause I was like, how did you, how did you get there? Like, I'm trying to get there. Um, so yeah. Yeah. here's another question about the book, right? So you, you have this title, uh, Dead Weight. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, I know what it signifies, but for everybody who has not had a chance to read the book yet, um, what is Dead Weight about? Like, you know, how, how did you even come up with the title? I, you know what? I don't. I think the, the, it, it, came, it evolved from, um, you know, the, the essay. There's an essay in there called Dead Weight, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about how I got to the, the University of New Haven. Um, and it talks about. Um, you know, the things that I had to go through to get the job and the things that I had to go, you know, you know, go through to keep, you know, to get that job and these other sort of external factors with Howard and uh, Howard University. And um, well, that's a little bit earlier, but Central State in terms of, you know, getting this um, distinguished uh, residence and scholar position and having it revoked and all that kind of stuff. And that, that, that kind of set me on that, that path of like, thinking about, you know, the dead weight that one has to sort of carry, um, you know, after incarceration. But see, you know, it's also compounded too, um, actually, because of, you know, what, what happens on the street as well um, before incarceration, um, you know, the many, the many things that, you know, that I was a part, I participated in on the streets um, and the lives that, that were affected behind that. There were many lives that were affected behind that. And, um, and I played a part in some of those, um, for sure. Um, and um, and it's you know so that's some that's that's dead weight too. Um, and it's about those choices and in in, in in the people that you let down and 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 so it's always those those things of you get past them, but you but you remember them and you can't you can't forget them. You know people move on, uh, but you know and. Sometimes in remembrance, and you know, you, there, there's a freedom in that. But it certainly, as a writer, uh, it, that's where I, that's what I, you know, I knew that I wanted to 
to think about dead weight in a broader sense too. And so um, I think that, that, that essay really got me going as well. So, you know, um, yeah. No, I think the title fits perfectly. And I think like, you know, metaphorically speaking, it's it's appropriate, like more than appropriate. It's this right. good. Um, so I actually want to talk about that title essay. And if you don't mind, I'm going to pose the question to you, but then my father and Gary can um, chime in because I think they'll have something to say. Yeah, no doubt, no okay. doubt, no doubt. So, in the title um, chapter, so dead weight or title essay, dead weight, you talk about um, historically black colleges and universities, um, notably um, Howard and Central State, like you said, they come up. Right. Um, and so you have this one line in that essay, it's like an epiphany you have, and you say, um, I am left with the terrible realization that the institutions I love so much are helping to perpetuate a troubling brand of blackness. Um, and so my question for mm -hmm. all three of you really is, um, have you experienced that institutional hypocrisy with HBCUs? Randall, of course, you know, reading the essay, I know you have, but I'm just wondering like if that, when you like notice it, if you have noticed it, does it create a moral dilemma? And what does that say about redemption like within a black space or like a black institution or, or the black community. Right. Well, let me answer, I'm going to answer this like this. I think, um, but when I say troubling the brand of black and blackness, I'm, I think back in terms, well, I'm speaking from, you know, the idea of being, you know, every time that I was rejected, it was from a HBCU. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like when you look at the statistics and the numbers of, you know, the black male in conservation uh, on the national clip. Mm -hmm. And and if you understand that, and and I think, you know, the, we talk about the mission of H HBCU, um, I think it can be an interesting thing when, you know, I, I'm not an isolated case in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it, you know, and so for me, um, yeah, cause, I mean, I, I think I really formulated that opinion when I got when I got rejected from I think uh, it was the Central State, and um, the provost was just like, "Yeah, we know we're wrong, but we just don't want you here." You know what I mean? It's like it's outrageous. And so it's like you know when you when you when you when you hear things like that, and you hear them from a, an HBC, but you know also in that essay, you know it's sort of layered a little bit, because like, I because I talk about you know, my love for HBCUs too now, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I talk yeah. about growing up um, and my, my mother and father were products of HBCUs. I talk yeah. about growing, going to like the Magic City Classic since I was like a little kid, like which is the oldest, you know, football rivalry HBCUs in the country. And sort of like, you know, every step along the way, it was always like the black experience, you know what I mean? And yeah. so for me, you know, and I don't know if it was an idyllic thing to think that um, that coming out of the experience, you know, Howard would, uh, you know, accept me or whatever. But I, I didn't think that that would be a thing. Um, but but let me just get back to also and, and, and bring Mark in. And, but and so, well, one of the things, you know, we, we, we need to sort of establish, too, in terms of, you know, Gary's relationship to all this, too, in terms of, at the time. You know, when we're talking about, I think Mark and I uh, were at Howard, and Howard was, was beginning to change, um, and it was becoming, you know, uh, a lot more freer. I think, uh, in a lot of ways, and in, um, in terms of a lot, in terms of the drug culture, in terms of you know, things that were happening on campus, um, and because, but, but, but also, you know, you have to realize that Gary was like a, a police officer, a Howard issue police officer, right? So that's how Gary fits in now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's sort, of, it's sort of like Gary has, you know, so he's sort of fits in that way, right? <laughs> in yeah, we got to we, we hear from them now. Yeah, so I, I want Gary to talk his piece in terms of being, being up at HU in the, in the early 80s. Um, and um, but I want to talk, bring Mark in first and, and talk about sort of like that, that whole climate of like what, what the eighties was like in terms of HU, but also in terms of like how easy it was to sort of, you know, and accepted it was in terms of that culture. 
right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, it was very good to hear you read. I'm proud and honored to, you know, be a part of this. So I too am a, I'm a second um, generation college graduate from HBCU. So HBCUs have always been a part of my life. Um, my experience at Howard, I had a, had a great experience at Howard. Um, academically, I was a Michael major. I matriculated to the College of Dentistry. I, my social life, I just couldn't balance the two. And right. during that particular time in the 80s, when um, cocaine, crack hit the scene, you know, um, the inside culture of Howard was up on the yard where it was just, you know, everywhere. On the campus, in the dorms, and to be able to, you know, go from being nobody to something overnight, that's what crack basically can make the average person, you know, become. Right. You know, uh, with the false sense of power, money, and then not only are you dealing with the yeah, because uh, you got to talk about the whole idea, you know, whole yeah, the, the, the yeah. status of Howard, right? Yeah, so, so. Yeah. so not only are you dealing with the drug <laughs> thing, but you're dealing with the culture and and, and the lifestyle. And right. so when you get caught up and you're trying to compete, you easily can lose your way. Right. Um, with, with with that particular thing, but you know, as far as I understand your experience as far as being rejected. And remember also, if you put it in context during that time, you know, here we are coming 17, 18 years old, coming to college. And what Howard did for me was it actually really woke. It was an awakening because at that particular time, I always knew I was black, but I hadn't really identified with my racial, ethnic and cultural identity. And mm -hmm. Being at an institution where you, you know, James Farmer, uh, former uh, CORE, uh, um, who, who ran CORE, founded CORE, being one of my professors and being enlightened on everything. And then at the same time, first Bush's, you know, president, you know, then Reagan, uh, the Iran Contra, the drugs, and just everything that was going on in the country you know, we became like radicals now, <laughs> you know, because they were labeling us as being something that we weren't. And right. so I think part of that helped us, you know, gravitate more to that particular culture. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, like I said, but, and then remember, Howard is an HBCU that's totally funded by the federal government. A lot of the other HBCUs don't get the money that Howard gets. And so even though Howard is the Mecca, the, the money is what talks. And when, 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 when the money is coming into the, to the university, the university has to adjust its policies uh, to keep getting the money. And so we as students, you know, didn't like that being whitewashed that way. Right, right, right. That's, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess you know all of that, and then from the you know from contextual standpoint, I think um, we were all introduced and sort of found these ways in which we you know got started on that journey of you know southern cocaine and at some point it became more more important than the mission that we went there to go do oh, you know what I mean? uh, and you know because at that time i think there was a lot going on but then i want to bring gary in right now um and so i met gary um when um at, at howard um and and you know we were doing some lightweight stuff then um but I think me and Gary, we kind of really um, sort of really connected after you got back out from Lorton. So can you talk a little bit about that, that Lorton experience, Gary? Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Because, um, I mean, I think that's important, maybe even before we even get started, you know, I mean, I think, you know, um, that, you know, being, you know, being entangled in, in something um, that, that, that sort of, because um, I, I know it had an effect, you know, uh, on how you begin to look at life, you know what I mean, a little bit in terms of doing what you were doing, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, it did. And Randall, um, thank you for bringing me on. Thanks everyone for bringing me on. Ashley, nice to meet you. I've known your father a long time. <laughs> he's, even a, he's even a blessing to even see Brother Mark. <laughs> but Randall, coming out of, I mean, working at Howard University as a special police officer was a good job starting off right out of mm -hmm. high school, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Got hooked up with some nonsense out there in the street, mm. caught a charge, went to Lord. And this was um, before the Lord incident happened, but I had met Randall and I had met some folks out of Miami that, that gave me a taste of the hustling business, the cocaine world. <laughs> and then go to Lord for 22 months and doing my time for something I wasn't even involved in. Right. But the road okay. I was on and the lawyer that we had retained was working with the court system. Right. You know, so um, things happen for a reason. So I chucked it up, um, kept on pushing. I think Lord got me ready for the feds. <laughs> <That's how> I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because right. Gordon was a gladiator school, at the same time Ray for Edmonds and his crew was coming through. They was coming through. He was going back and forth to court by way of helicopter, but that was um that was a it wasn't easy, you know. Mm -hmm. but you mind your business, you stay to yourself, you do your time, you try to better yourself, you come on home and just try to stay in your lane, right? You know, but. Yeah. Off of that, you know, but yeah. it did get me ready for the phase, not knowing that the phase would come later on down the road. Right, you know, but you know, bit for context, and I think you know, uh, Gary and I is probably spending the most time, um, you know, going down. We we've been we've done a lot of things together. We traveled to Miami. Um, <laughs> We've Honestly. been involved in a lot of stuff. Gary's kind of I'm gonna probably save my life a couple of times messing around doing some stuff too. Um, but and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But um, I think. I, I write in this book about 1303 T Street, um, and we talk about um, there's a shootout there, right? Um, mm -hmm. That happens, um, and we'll probably get to that a little bit later. Um, but in terms of how that's how that's the that's the, the triangle in terms of how, but it's a little bit more because we both had, you know, you know, a couple of mutual friends that sort of introduced us to that game, that world. Um, and they became, you know, in, sort of influential in how we stayed in that in their in that narrative for so long. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Um and we stayed in that, in that narrative a long, long, long time. Um and even, you know, when toward the end when Mark and I was um, you know, and it's interesting too because all of us were has been in jail together too. Like <laughs> like we kinda like <laughs> it's like we kinda like came in around the same time. Like we it was like something was like calling us and like, okay, it's time to come on in, man. It's like yeah. you know, for one 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 thing or another, like we all ended up um, you know, back in jail. I mean we're in jail and we actually we're in the same block that I'm, I was talking about. The one I was talking about, you know, you know, um going, you know, going to yeah i think it's perception versus reality mm -hmm. going to see big grip and talking about that's the that's the unit right there that we were in mm -hmm. all three of us you it's know what crazy. I mean? like from one institution to another exactly like, it was really crazy yeah yeah so um and you know the cycle that we go through um yeah okay well i have a, a yeah i know you got some more related so, question i could yeah. pose for you okay so um you actually pose a rhetorical question in one of your essays and you ask the question, um, how does a person negotiate the dead weight that attaches itself to the body after being discharged from prison? Right. And so my question is like, after that experience, how do you navigate or negotiate 
and situations and spaces that like demand an explanation from you like over and over again like do you ever get sick of your own narrative like is it oh yeah no question i do and i try to but you know in certain situations like i said i do understand like the, the narrative has to be told um in order for well, whatever reason it, it needs to be told um whether I'm, I'm going to um, a juvenile facility or if I'm going to some other place, uh, adult detention center, uh, you know, just put it like this. I was just in, um, I think it was um, Essex County last week, um, talking to some, some officials about putting up um, the, the, the recording studios in prison, right? And so, mm-hmm. and that's one of the projects they were doing. Um, and so I have to tell my story. Mm-hmm. Because people want to hear it, and mm-hmm. they want to know why you are people who what you know what what gives you the sort of like motivation to think that you could do some change in this world, you know, when when it comes to things like that. So for me, you know, I'm clear on why I do it. Uh, although you know, I don't want I, I get I, I get tired I don't I get tired of doing it. But when I do it nowadays, I do it for a purpose. I try to most of the time. Um, you know, um, sometimes my students ask me stuff too, so. But I mean, like in that initial state, like when you when you first come home and like how you were talking about in the book, like oh, you're yeah, that's different kind of yeah. safe housing, you're just trying to find a stable job and it's like yeah. you have to continue to like. And that's a different thing. That, yeah, that's a different kind of, you know, sort of telling. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, it became this thing and then you become very. And I think maybe even Mark and um, Gary can speak to this a little bit. I want to talk to them about, you know, some of the th- things. Because I, I mean, I know, because I, I know when uh, when Gary was coming home, sort of trying to find a job and do some things. Uh, yeah, but, I'd like to, i like for both of them to. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, you do, because it's like um, the doors are closed and, 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 and you, you're trying to keep this positive thing. And. And it's like, wow, man. It's, it, and the, it, but, you know, all of us kind of had to go through that. But I think um, all you need to do is sort of like find somebody to believe in you, just, you know, give you a chance, and, you know. So, but I'm going to ask Gary. Gary, what did you, you know, think about when you're coming back from the, from um, when you're coming back from the feds um, in terms of getting a job? Because I remember you calling me and, and we were talking about, um, you know, trying to get the hook up a couple of times, right? And some of the things that you had to go to get to, to start working, right? Yeah, it wasn't easy being uh, an ex felon or with a uh, convict, um, just getting out of jail. Just, we're not in jail, you're not a federal prison. It's a big difference from jail and federal right. prison. Right, right. Um, I kind of prepared myself over all them years, waiting my time. What I'm gonna do, where I'm gonna start with this, like you call it, an X on your back. Right. You know, um, but I told myself I'm not gonna let that stop me. Mm-hmm. I'm keep on pushing, I'm gonna keep on pushing. When I touched down um, January the 13th, 2011, I went straight to PRC, which is a halfway house in Rockville, Maryland. I went on a job interview um, like maybe 10 days later as I was there trying to get myself acclimated with being back home. And I got a job. Mm-hmm. Okay. The job I had when I came home. Okay. It was a Peapod. We had. Um, oh, you know what? I remember that job. <laughs> they, had, they had a job, they had a job fair. So I knew I was going to a job fair. So I asked one of the correctional guys downstairs, yeah, let me do some research on what PPAR was about. So it was about 20 of us that left the halfway house, went to the job fair, and I'm the only one that got the job. <laughs> because the lady asked anyone, is is anyone here that know what PPAR is about? Yeah, me. I raised my hand, I gave her the whole scenario on the research I found about Peapod, found in 1989 right. by Mark and, and his brother, whatever was it. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was ready. Then the guy said, man, you ain't share that with me? No, nah, bro, I'm trying to get my job. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I don't need you to get it. You know, I didn't mind sharing, but 
Let me get place first. I've been gone a long time, little bro. You just got a little slap on the wrist, came on back home. I <laughs> right. got slap on the head. Yeah, how much time you did? We just 17 and a half, right? 17 and a half. 17 years, nine months, and 45 days. Let me ask you this question too, Ruth, if you don't mind me asking. I know I know what you want to so in in terms of like the you know what you would do. You do you do do you often feel that your sentence and was Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before you even say, I mean, um you kill somebody, you get five years. You join the drug conspiracy, <laughs> and you give me seventeen years as a plea, and twenty-two years if I go to trial. Right. But I ain't kill nobody. You didn't kill nobody, right? Right. Kill right. Nobody. Right. Okay? I mean, it's 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 like really. Then you give me a four million dollar bond. I ain't where I'm going. I ain't you know, <laughs> my brother Randall. Now we did go out the country a couple of times, but um, <laughs> take care of business. So that's what that for me. Four million dollar bond. Come on, then y'all need to stop. Right, that's the federal government for you. That that's the Fed. Yeah. Right. I, I'm just saying in terms of I know you and I were a lot of cats that were you know in had so you know selling and whatever and got caught up in versus the crack versus the whole kind of thing. Um, and, you know, conspiracy charges sometimes often, you know, catch those who probably, you know, probably shouldn't even be, you know, in the conversation in terms of when you start talking about, you know, 30, 40 years, right? You know, big numbers like that. Um, and oftentimes there's other underlying situations to see even to why you're even in that situation. So anyway, um, you know, Go ahead, Mark. Come on, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, a drug charge carries more than a murder charge today. And with the one to 100 ratio that they had with the mandatory sentencing. Right, right, right. That, that took us all out. Um, right. And so they wanted to give me 25 years no parole for a, a drug charge. I ended up getting 14 years. And I served 44 months on it, but right. um, I never. It, it's dead weight. It'll always be dead weight. They they say you can get it, get things expunged and off your record, and but it's always going to be there. But yeah. for myself, I never let that language, that X, that con define who I was as an individual. That's that's what a lot of them want to see us as. And, we, and if you buy into that, then, you know, you start getting depressed and right. close your progress and, and everything now. But I was fortunate that I had some credentials behind my name and I had done some things before, you know, I was incarcerated. I didn't get in trouble until later in age, right? And so, um, the way it all it affects you with voting, but now they have let a lot of us begin to vote now. I've I've voted in the last three elections. Right. right. You know, right. you know, Obama was my first election I ever voted in my life, man. And, like... and then it affects <laughs> us. So it affects you when you try to go to school to better yourself with education. Right. It affects you there. You can you can have a murder charge and get some money to go to school, but you can't have a drug charge. Right, it, it affects <laughs> us. It affects us with housing, right? It, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's real. All of those are real yeah, too. All those are real. But today, society, you know, it's always that that question: is it a moral? Is it a moral problem, or is it a public health issue? And so now the paradigm is switching more to it being a public health policy and a lot of money and everything is going in towards that. And finally they realize who knows best than, you know, the recovering addict, the therapeutic value of one helping another. Right. Before, right. before that, the past 30 years, they tried every type of theory that, you know, to get some results. But now that's why they're doing the recovery coach, the peer support supervisor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of that stuff, the paradigm is, is switched to that. But, um, 
The, weight, the dead weight never leaves. I do. I will say that as time goes on, as opposed to when you first come home, uh, it gets easier because you've navigated your way through. And a lot of times before, it used to be, remember, ban the box. Right. You know, that's gone. And I always used to say, you know, my answer was, um, probation time served, we'll explain later. <laughs> yeah, that's what, and, that's um, what you have to do. But, man. But you, you really have to, you know, stay positive and, and you know, don't let, I'm fortunate to have, you know, two professional parents that instilled in me, you know, don't let anyone else define who you are. And, right. and I set my own definition and my own standards. And at the end of the day, all they can say is yes or no. And it's a numbers game. And, you know, you got to play the numbers game. The more, you know, and then you have to identify what particular niche you want to get into and, 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 you know, go from there, right? And so, you know, but the dead weight never leaves you. They say no. you pay your debt to society. That's a bunch of crap. <laughs> and the fourth estate, and if I could say one more thing. Go ahead. Uh, incarceration, state, feds, is not what the fourth estate depicts it to be. It is, it, it's a whole nother world, but it's not what TV and the media portray it to be. You have, you have, you have, you have individuals of all color, non-color, who who are, you know, some are guilty, some are not guilty, but everybody is. Um, you have some brilliant, fascinating minds in there, and, and all they need is the opportunity. We all make mistakes. The only difference was we got caught. There are plenty of people, like Randall said in his book, in that particular um, piece, one of the essays. You know, you 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 praise somebody who hasn't been, uh, let's say, arrested or charged, and they could be doing worse things than, you know, something. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I don't, I don't ask for any pity. I'm not proud of my journey. I feel as if, I'm, if anything, I'm mad at myself because I let myself become a statistic when I knew better, right? But when you get caught up in the grips of the addiction, the lifestyle, and the money, the false pride, the power, none of that matters anymore. I used to go to dental school, walk in one door, and go out the back. Just to, you know, and I was a good dental student. I, I was number five in my class, 3.67 GPA. It wasn't that we couldn't do it, but the lifestyle was just so much more alluring. Exactly, and yeah. I'll yeah. be quiet from there, but <laughs> yeah, we can have this conversation all day. I'm gonna turn it back over to Ashley. I know we got to wrap up, man. I didn't realize an hour and a half goes that fast. But... It does go fast, right? Okay, so this <laughs> is my my very last thing, and then we're gonna be quiet so people can ask a question if they have one, or Lisa can um come back on. But so, Randall, like when you are talking about changing the language around incarceration, like when we all walk away from this. Like, what is one thing that we all can, like, do, right, to help change that narrative or, like, do more justice to um, to that that whole, I don't know, like, you know. Now, for me, it's simple. I think, I think we have to be, really be, you know, careful about thinking about ways in which um, we, we, um, we hear those stereotypical images in the media, how they portray to us, how they come on and how, you know, they're prevalent and presented to us in ways in which they're, they're meant to sort of get gone on our attention. And once we become aware of those things, I think that's the first step because we, we understand like, um, there's, that's, that's, that's something that's sort of deliberate um, to sort of like continue that whole idea about, you know, keeping the citizens safe. And I'm not saying that the citizen shouldn't be safe, and I'm not saying that things don't happen, but I'm just saying that 
I think we could be more careful with the language um, and give people the chance to sort of to, to redeem themselves and walk their walk. If we if we continue if we label them and have that on their back as soon as they get out after we've asked everything of them to do mm-hmm. you know that's the, that's the thing like okay what else do you need me to do you know what i mean it's like yeah. okay i've done that and so why are you so on my back man yeah. i think i believe it right there <laughs> kind of you know what i mean so in in and and i think we don't necessarily get that like why that that sort of ex- that that, that, that invisible tethered string that's the elastic thing that's sort of tethered to the body after the physical release from prison right yeah, you know, yeah. that's the thing and, and 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 how it continues to sort of like you know tug at you and you can you know however you're doing it's going to always remind you a little, little bitty ways like hey i'm still here right you know that right like, i'm not gonna go anywhere Anytime you do, you got to talk. You got to, you know, I'm going to always be prevalent. You got to talk about me all the time. Like, you got to. <laughs> so just get in front of the narrative. Then. Yeah, right. Get in front of it. Right? That was no, get, in front of, get in front of it. Get in front of it. You know, run toward that thing. You know? yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I appreciate, you know, you, yeah. of course. Nah. Uh, my father, of course, because I wouldn't be here without him. And then, Gary, I appreciate you, too. It was really nice to meet you in this format um yes. and i'm sure there's more nice. opportunities for us to um you know have some conversation and lisa thank you for having us and becca thank you for being here so much we have maybe a minute worth of something to tell you and then we'll let you all go so i want to thank everybody for being here um we have shared randall's books in the chat but um Randall, please add any social media handles or links or anything that you want so people can follow up with you. Um, As a note for the questions that you sent in that we didn't get to ask Randall, I will ask Randall and we will include his answers in our next newsletter. So please sign up for the Notebooks Collective newsletter. Um, Also, we really wanna thank Northwestern University Press for their support of this event and their generosity in offering attendees a discount on Randall's book. If you order from their website, which Anne dropped in the chat earlier, and use the code Horton, you can receive 35% off. And it, it's such a good book, you guys. You all want it. Um, last thing is to please follow the Notebooks Collective on our social media accounts and sign up for our newsletter. Um, uh, Becca is probably putting those links in the chat as we speak. Um, We want to thank you all for coming. And as the very last thing, we would love if you would turn on your cameras and unmute yourself and show Randall and Ashley and Mark and Gary a round of appreciation for sharing their stories and reading for us tonight. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you you for coming, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, hey Lauren. <laughs> hey. Nice to like, uh, hey, hey, <laughs> I see a lot of I see a lot of good friends and old people. Josephine, hey, oh man, hey, Miss Johnson. Yeah, how you Johnson, doing? how you doing? <laughs> Mama Johnson over there now. Hi, Grandma. <laughs> 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 wow, Meg. Oh man. So everything. Thank you all for coming. I'm very humble. Meg is right there. Hey Danielle. It's my colleague. Hey, um, Marie good to there. see you. Great reading. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, nah, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Um, but um, hey Jess. Um and uh, so for me it's like uh I, I have to thank, you know, Lisa, this is this was a great Lisa. Thanks for taking the reins of this and yeah. really doing something different um a little bit different uh, than a normal well you know to do the book i mean a book launch but sort of like having another kind of conversation and just um i thought it added a little bit more flavor to it and um and i want to thank you know uh, mark and uh gary um yeah i mean it means even more to have these guys just here um and understanding what they've gone what they've gone through um in their lives to sort of come out of that and do something uh really positive in their lives today um and i'm really proud of them you know they know it though uh, we talk about it all the time right <laughs> we do <laughs> so 
you know, I mean, I think because we understand each other very well, right? Yeah. Um, and what we have to do each and every day um, to make this thing work. So thank you guys. I appreciate you. Add, you know, um, last thing, um, you know, uh, having you as a, you know, I've had some amazing people and, and all of them. I, I don't want to take anything from anybody, uh, but you know, um, when I worked with you, it definitely had to be a special, you know, having known Mark for all my, you know, for all his adult life. <laughs> and, you know, and just getting, you know, a, a bird's eye view of like even more of the stuff we talk about in terms of the dead weight, in terms of like the collateral effects of things that we do. Um, and, and it's been, you know, really opening in that way. And that's why I wanted you to, to, um, to sort of moderate this. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you.